by the way, footnote, because I know some of you are interested, were that to be unacceptable, morally, ethically, or for any reason, capitalism cannot function. All workers, consciously or not, must accept that the labor they've done, their brains, their creativity, their enthusiasm, their skill that's embodied in these raw materials, tools, and equipment to transform them into this other thing that they have, having done the work, made the transformation, they must accept they have neither claim nor right to any of it. It's instantly and automatically somebody else's. Footnote, if I had time. Marx and a whole enormous field of Marxian psychology and Marxian sociology has been fascinated with what I just said for a long time. And one of the words under which their fascination has been expressed is called the theory of alienation. That enormously important things happen to human beings when they are torn away, notice the language, I want to dramatic, make it dramatic for you, when people are torn away from their own product. But we don't have the time to do that. So capitalism involves the capitalist in this activity. But notice, the whole point and purpose of the capitalist is begin, to begin with a quantity of money, M, and to end with a quantity of money, M prime, that's larger. The whole point of the exercise is to end up with more money than you began with. The difference, the extra money you have at the end compared to the beginning, that's called surplus value. The point of a capitalist is to end up with more surplus value. To have more money at the end than at the beginning. So now let's look at this closely. The capitalist starts, let's say, with 100, and he buys 50 worth of means of production and 50 worth of labor power. So he has 100 in money, now he has 100 in these two things. And then he puts them together, and he ends up with a commodity, which he sells for money. This commodity has to be more than 100, or else he's not doing what he's supposed to do and not what he wants to do. So typically, in our example, if we start with 100, 50 in lumber, glue, nails, and so on, and 50 for workers making chairs, we're going to end up with a quantity of chairs, says Marx. That quantity of chairs has more value than 100. It has, say, 150 worth of value in that chair, which the capitalist then sells for money, 150. Bingo, the capitalist is happy. He started with 100. He ends up with 150. The difference, the 50, is the surplus value he got out of production. So now Marx asks himself, still in volume one, well, where did he get it? How did it happen? And Marx's answer is all about his theory. The gain didn't come from exchange. In general, people just give an amount of value in one form to get an equivalent amount of value in another. They're not going to give up $30 worth of something for $40 worth of something. The, the people who can give up the 30 to get 40 would enjoy it, but the people with the 40 and the 30, they wouldn't enjoy it. So he says, we have to look in production. That's where the magic happens. Something happens in production such that the tools, equipment, and raw materials put together with the worker produce more value than they themselves have. Clue, what produces more value than it itself has? Workers. You pay the workers their wage, but they produce for you more than that. So the value of the chair is got in it, the value of all the tools, raw materials, and equipment used up, plus the value added by the worker. But what the value added by the worker is, is more than the value he's paid. And we already went through that. Therein lies, as Marx puts it, the secret of capitalism. The extra that the capitalist has at the end, the surplus he gets, the whole point and purpose of the capitalist, to end up with more money than he began with. The reason he has it 
is because the workers produce more than he pays them. They collect that. It's embodied in those shares and realized by the capitalist when he sells them. And with his 150, he now commences the next round of chair production on a larger basis. He starts with 150 as compared to the 100. That's the basic idea. Okay, so that's how surplus is produced. That's where it's produced. The workers who produce goods and services for an employer who gets the goods and services and sells them in the market, sells the chairs for money, that's what all capitalists do, and we have located who produces the surplus? The workers. Who gets the surplus? The employer. So Marx has done the first part of what he promised. He has identified in capitalism who is doing the surplus producing, who's getting it, where this happens, and how it's organized. That's all preliminary. Now we begin for what's new today. We're going to ask the next logical question. What does the capitalist do in capitalism with the surplus he gets from the worker? In the case of modern capitalism, I'm going to show it this way. I start with this little rectangle. I've got it divided into two parts. Necessary labor, ML, and surplus labor. Necessary labor is the work workers do that produces a value equivalent to what the boss pays them. To use simple language, it's the part of the work workers do where they get the fruits of it back to themselves, in a sense, to consume. Surplus labor is all the work workers do that they don't get back, that is not paid. It's the surplus. And the surplus, I'm going to make Point. This surplus here, I'm going to make into a larger rectangle simply because I have to go through with you all the things that capitalists do with it. So I need it to be big so I can display it for you here. So a capitalist gets a surplus. Having made the chairs and sold them, he sold $150 worth of chairs, but it only cost him $100 to get that done. 50 for the tools, equipment, raw material, 50 for the workers. So he's ahead, 50 bucks. That's his surplus. That is, he gets the surplus, but he didn't produce it. None of it. And you're going to see that in a minute. So what does a capitalist do with the surplus? That's the question. Because remember, I told you, Marx's analysis talks about the production of the surplus, the appropriation, and the distribution. Now we're going to talk about the distribution. Up until now, we talked about the production and the appropriation. Okay. Make it modern. Who is the capitalist who gets the surplus into his or her hands today in the United States and most other countries? Well, most of the productive work in the United States and in most other capitalist countries is done by a particular institution called a capitalist corporation. It's a legal instrument. It was set up in the 19th century or maybe a little bit earlier. It has different names in different countries. In England, for example, it's called a limited company. Some of you notice that uh, sometimes brands like to use the word LTD at the end of something. That stands for limited. Limited is the British equivalent of Inc. in the United States, I-N-C, for incorporate. If you're interested, we can talk about it later. It's a legalism. It's not crucial for what we have to do. So most productive work is done in a corporation. So now the question. Who gets $150 when you sell the chairs in our little store in the corporation? Who gets it? Do the workers get it? We've already been there. No. Do the managers get it? No. Do the shareholders get it? No. Who gets the money? Who gets the $150? Answer. A very interesting group of people. Not a single person unless you have a capitalist who's an individual capitalist, and there are very few of those, and even if you add them all up, they have many numbers, but they don't do a significant amount of business in the United States. The overwhelming bulk of business in the United States is done by corporations. And the answer is something called the board of directors. That's the capitalist in the Marxist theory. The board of directors, 
by the way, typically in the United States and in other countries, a group of people numbering between 10 and 20. Most boards are in that range. 10 and 20 individuals. By the way, they appropriate the surplus, not individually. Uh, let me do that again. They appropriate the surplus collectively. The notion of capitalism as an individualist system is a crock. That is an ideological crock. You should get out, out of it, or over it, forget about it. Individual appropriation of the surplus is not significant in a capitalist economy such as the United States. Surpluses are appropriated by a collectivity, usually numbering 10 or 20 people. The board of directors gets the 150 bucks from selling the chairs. Now, we're going to assume, just for simplicity, it doesn't have to be, we're going to assume that this company wishes to continue to produce chairs. So out of the $150 that it gets from selling the chairs, it takes 100 of them and replenishes the tools, equipment, and raw materials used up and rehires the people it paid 50 to to work the first one. In other words, it keeps production going. So we're going to focus our attention on what it does with the other $50, with the surplus it got. The whole point of the capital was to get that surplus, to make his 100 become 150. So he got 50 as a surplus, and so the question is, what does the board of directors do with the 50 bucks it gets of surplus? Or 50 million, or 50 billion, doesn't matter. The idea is all the same. And the answer is, the capitalist, like all surplus appropriators in all systems, slave, feudal, communist, it doesn't make any difference. What the appropriators of the surplus do, what they must do, is use the surplus to keep the system going. In other words, their position as the appropriators of the surplus doesn't happen automatically doesn't happen without effort, doesn't happen freely. It has to be paid for, it has to be organized. Let me go back and give you a simple example. Remember I said to you 15 minutes ago, if ethically or intellectually workers in capitalism thought that it was immoral to have a working person pour his or her creativity, her time, her energy, literally her life blood into producing something and then have no say over who gets it, what's done with it, what happens to it, to be immediately separated from your own product. If that was to be a moral position that is intolerable, capitalism couldn't function. It couldn't function. Workers have to give all that up. Well, let's suppose in any society that it is always possible that workers who are ripped away from the fruits of their own labor and effort, suppose they might get, I don't know, pissed off. 